at the top of your page, write large W, little plus sign, little w equals s. Now I need to explain to you the purpose that Maximilian Kolbe gave this math equation to his seminarians that he was speaking to. We know that God's will is the big W and the little w is our will. He was trying to teach the seminarians about Mary's relationship with the Holy Spirit. The will of Mary and the will of God are perfectly united. That's why I can say truly Mary's will is God's will. That's why she's sinless. A lot of times we get confused and we, when we say Mary is the spouse of the Holy Spirit, how can that be that she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit and the spouse of Saint Joseph? It's because when somebody gets married, they give themselves to their bride or their groom fully, totally, completely, and they're open to new life. This is theology of the body language. And so when the two give themselves to one another, they share the same will, they share the same everything, the two become one. And Maximilian Kolbe would call Mary because the Holy Spirit and Mary are so intimately united that new life came from them. They're so intimately united that it's as if, as if, they're not one, but it's as if they were one. And he would give her this, this title. In Latin, it's quasi incarnatus est. She is the quasi incarnation of the Holy Spirit. So the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Word, became flesh in Jesus Christ. That's one person. The Holy Spirit does not have flesh, but it's almost as if the Virgin Mary was the flesh of the Holy Spirit. When the Virgin Mary acted, she acted in union with the Holy Spirit. When the voice of the Virgin Mary spoke, it was as if it was the very voice of the Holy Spirit. So much so that when she greeted her cousin Elizabeth, Elizabeth heard the sound of her greeting, that she was filled with the Holy Spirit, the child leapt in her womb, and she was sanctified. The role of the Holy Spirit is sanctification. Very important, Maximilian Kolbe, as long as all the other theologians teach us, that the role of the Holy Spirit is what? To make us like Christ. The role of the Virgin Mary is to what? Make us like Christ. St. Augustine teaches that when you give your life to the Virgin Mary, she puts you in her womb. Why? What is the role of the womb of the Virgin Mary? To make Christ. And when she puts you into her womb, the Holy Spirit comes and Christifies you. The role of the Holy Spirit is, so we all know that the Father begets the Son and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit does not give new life in the Trinity. He is the love between the two. But in Mary, there is life through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when you give your life to the Virgin Mary, the Holy Spirit will come to you and make you into Christ. Very important. The Holy Spirit goes where Mary is. So the more you become like Mary, the perfect disciple, the perfect apostle, the perfect everything, the more you become Marianized, the more the Holy Spirit is going to go to you. I said earlier that the church is dead. What is the life of the church? It's the Holy Spirit. Our Lord left us and he said, it is better that I go so that you may have the Holy Spirit. When did the apostles receive the Holy Spirit? At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles. We would say that Pentecost is the birth of the church. Well, who is the mother of the church? The Virgin Mary. So if Mary is the mother of the body of Christ, she's the mother of the members of the body of Christ, if she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit, if she already received the fullness of the Holy Spirit, at the Annunciation, it is now at Pentecost, through Mary's intercession, Mediatrix of all grace, that the Apostles received that special gift that gives them the ability to work miracles in the name of Jesus. All these charismatic gifts, working miracles, preaching, teaching, all these gifts that you're going to be growing in in the Sacrament of Confirmation, they only come to life when you're in union with Christ. Because they're Christ's gifts. He's working them through you. Mary gives life to the church at Pentecost. It's the union of Mary and the Holy Spirit. Only when the apostles were with Mary, when Mary taught them how to pray, Mary taught them how to live, only then were they ready to receive the Holy Spirit. I said earlier to you 
that many people leave the church. And the common denominator between those who thrive and those who wither away is Our Lady. That was true also of the apostles. All of the apostles saw Jesus work miracles. St. Peter walked on water. James and John, great saints. James went away, John did not, and they were brothers. What was the difference between James and John? John loved the Virgin Mary, and James did not have that same relationship. Every apostle abandoned Jesus except for one, John. He was the one that Jesus said is my beloved. Why was John beloved? Because he had a special relationship with the Virgin Mary. And so he took Mary into his own home. Very, very, very important. The will of God is that you have Mary as your mother. I was talking to a mother earlier today, and we were talking about how a mother just is so sweet and provides a special love, a special care that a father simply cannot do. In my own family, when one of my children gets hurt, especially the younger ones, they get hurt and I come to them and I'm like, let me help you. And they don't want me. They want their mom. And even though I'm like, here, let me give it a kiss, let me do that, for some reason they want mom. I wish they wanted me. I'll do the same little rub and the kiss on it and make it, and it doesn't work. No matter how bad it is, they long for mom. It's God's will that you have somebody in your life to give you sweetness. When a baby comes out of the womb of the, of the mother, the baby's like this. What does that baby want? It's built to want the milk of mom. I hold the baby, and the baby, I'm the, I'm the dad. And they're like, the baby's on the side. Mm. I don't have what you're looking for, baby. Mm. I don't have that. You're, you're making me feel bad right now. I can't give you the milk that your heart is longing for. God wills that you have a mother. You have a natural instinct for a mother. So Mary's will and God's will are the same. But it is God's will because he loves you so much that you have a special sweet path. Saint Louis de Montfort, St. Alphonsus, St. Bonaventure, St. Bernard, St. Augustus, all the greats would say, Mary is the fastest, the quickest, the easiest, the most secure, the sweetest path to Jesus Christ. So we know Mary's will is the same as God's will. We know it is God's will that you have a mother to go with you everywhere. Now I want you to write a new equation. Actually, it's the same equation if you flip it upside down. Capital M plus lowercase m equals S. If I unite my will to Mary's will, that's sanctification. Her will and God's will are the same, but Mary's will is the sweetest, fastest, easiest version of God's will. It's the fastest path. So I don't even say God's will anymore. People will say, that was good. And I say Mary's will, and they look at me like I'm crazy. Because Mary's will makes everything better. If I came over here and I gave you a talk that was God's will, it would be good. It would be good. But God has willed that if you go with, in, and through Mary, it's better, it's sweeter, it's more efficacious. What does it mean to go with Mary? Mary's with me. She's literally with me everywhere I go. What does it mean to go through Mary. I can ask God for things true, but I'm also asking Mary to ask with me, for me, through me. What does it mean in Mary? Now this is where Maximilian Colby, my dear friend, I love you, he gets nuts. He says, you want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. He says, it is no longer I who live, but Mary who lives in me. Wow, he's taking words from Jesus about Jesus, but it's true. They're, they're totally united. He would say, we should be transubstantiated into the Virgin Mary. What? What is transubstantiation? It's a change in the substance, not in what it looks like. So how can I let Mary live in me? I do her will. St. Teresa of Avila, doctor of prayer. She said, Jesus has no hands and feet except for my own to do his will, to live. Now, Maximilian Colby would say, Our Lady has no hands and feet except for mine. And when you give your hands and feet to the Virgin Mary by doing her will, what does Mary do with her feet? She crushes serpents. What does Mary do? She brings Christ. My friend Ben, on the back of his hoodie, there's a great quote from Maximilian Colby that says, Union with the Immaculata 
to be an instrument. I'm saying you don't have to read it. I'm telling it to you. I, th- imprint this in your heart. You can turn back around, Ben. Union with the Immaculata, to be an instrument in her immaculate hands. This is the secret which guarantees success. It guarantees success. Our Lady's formula is perfect. You cannot lose when you're doing her will. It might look like you're losing. It might look like Jesus is losing, but she never, ever loses. She always wins. The problem is our idea of victory is different from her idea of victory. Every child of the Virgin Mary will end up on the cross. Everybody in this room is going to have suffering. But Our Lady is going to make it sweeter. She's going to make it redemptive. She's going to make it bearable in your own life. Our Lady will guide you, but you have to ask her. You just have to say, Blessed Mother, guide me. Blessed Mother, be with me. Blessed Mother, help me. I have another great quote from Maximilian Colby here. Through Mary, you can do all things. She refuses nothing to sinners, and Jesus can refuse nothing to her. There's another great long quote, which says, if you give your life, I'm giving you the paraphrase, if you give your life to the Virgin Mary, and you follow this formula of striving to do her will, not only will you see miracles of grace, but you will become a saint, and at that, a great saint, Maximilian Colby said. So he's saying to you, if you do this, this is a formula for great sanctity. And then he says to you, come follow me. And he proves it to us by becoming a great saint. You have the formula to go from victory to victory. And now all of this information I have given to you over the past two days is very difficult to call to mind. It takes a lot of practice. And now I'm going to give you the secret on how to live it with only thinking about one thing. But I have, to re- I have to remind you of this. What are we doing? Our goal is to become like Mary. Why? Why become like Mary? It's God's will, yes. It's sweeter, it's easier, yes, true. But Mary is the most pleasing creature to God. So I become like Mary, and I am more pleasing to Jesus. What does Mary do to me? Mary makes me like Jesus. So I become Mary for Jesus, And then I give myself to Mary because Jesus is the model of Christian perfection. I give myself to Mary because Jesus did it. You have to know this before we get into this next aspect. This is so important that we are going to kneel down and pray three Hail Marys so that you can really take it into your soul. So please kneel down. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed Mother, I ask you for the grace to be able to communicate this message effectively. Please let me die, let you speak, let them hear with your ears, with your heart. Speak to your spouse, the Holy Spirit, on our behalf, that we can say what it is you want us to say, and they can hear what it is you want them to hear. St. Maximilian Colby, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Dominic, pray for us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And may all glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. O oh, my Jesus, forgive us of our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Amen. Okay, what is the answer to all of our problems? I've been holding it in my hand. I open carry if you haven't noticed. I've been holding it in my hand, and I carry it in my hand pretty much everywhere that I go. In order to appreciate this, I had to give you basically two days worth of content that can be summarized by this. But before we get to this, where did this come from? What are the origins of this? I have to explain it to you. There was a great preacher named Dominic de Guzman. He had a charismatic gift of preaching. He was very holy, very passionate. He was the kind of priest that if he was at your parish, you would say, when is he doing the mass? I want to go to his masses. His homilies are fire. The problem was, 
when people would go to hear his homilies and he would preach all around, nobody was being converted. And not only that, people wouldn't even remember what the man was saying. And there was a great heresy at the time called the Albigensian heresy, as I'm sure many of you know, because you all are very smart. And that was basically, like our biggest problem today is, we've got so many problems, is atheism, agnosticism, materialism, modernism. Okay, so their biggest problem at the time was the Albigensian heresy. And Dominic was failing at preaching to convert them. So he offered himself to the Virgin Mary as a victim soul. He said to the Blessed Mother, I give myself to you. I am not going to eat. I am not going to sleep. I'm going to do the worst sort of penances. Back in the day, they would hit themselves. They would do all sorts of very tough and difficult penances, things that we would look at and be like, whoa, easy there, Dominic. But he didn't shy away from it. He felt this was a special calling of his. And to the point that he fainted, could have been dead from that, the Virgin Mary appeared to him and said, Dominic, my son, my well-beloved son, I have heard your prayers and I have come to answer you. What was Dominic's prayer? He was praying to God for some solution that would call down the mercy of God, give him the ability to convert hardened sinners, call down the power of the Holy Spirit so that the church can be renewed and to bring grace into every circumstance. And Our Lady said, I'm going to give you that answer. And it's going to be an answer for today and for the future. And this is, it, I have to be very specific on what she said, and I have to explain and break it down for you. She said, in this type of warfare, the answer has been and always will be the angelic salutation. The angelic salutation is when the angel Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary. Why is that the answer? Because it was those words that brought about the incarnation of God. Those words brought God into the world. So in any darkness, the angelic salutation, the incarnation of our Lord in the womb of the Virgin Mary, is the answer to our problems. She says the angelic salutation has been and always will be the battering ram that will be successful in this kind of warfare. And then she said something else we have to take to our heart. She said, if you want to be successful, preach my Psalter. Very important thing that she said. Preach my Psalter. What does that mean? At the time of St. Dominic, and for many years after, most people could not read. The monks could read, and they would chant the Psalms, the Liturgy of the Hours, 150 Psalms. Lay people would carry around beads like these, and they would pray an Our Father 150 times, the Hail Mary 150 times, and other people prayed various prayers, some to angels, just various prayers. And Mary said to Dominic, preach the Marian Psalter, preach my Psalter, and add to that the mysteries of the life of Jesus Christ. And if you do that, you're going to bear extraordinary fruit. If it's true, that should be true. And we see this truth played out in the life of St. Dominic. If you read the book, The Secret of the Rosary, St. Louis de Montfort goes into great detail where even the youngest, youngest Catholics began to perform extraordinary penances and live lives of great sanctity. Those who were horrible sinners were reformed. Miracles and signs and wonders spread throughout the world and the church at the spreading of the preaching of the Psalter. Very important to take into account. If it's true, if it, everything I said about the Virgin Mary today is true, that she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit, that she's the mother of God, that she's wisdom, that she's grace, that she's all these things, that means if, if, I'm not saying it is, I, I believe it is, but I'm not making the argument yet. If that is true, everything about this prayer should be perfect. If this came from heaven, and it, the Virgin Mary is perfect as we were saying she's perfect, this thing should be perfect. But when I look at this, I will be honest with you, this is a very difficult thing to do. I've been doing this for many years. I promote this all the time. But when I pray this prayer, I die inside. It's hard for me. It's dry for me. Often it's boring and very, very difficult. I have to force myself to do this. So people, young people will say, it's boring. I don't want to pray that. I hate that my family makes me pray it. Good. That's the first ingredient. The first ingredient that makes this devotion powerful is that it is boring. 
it does kill you. But what is the goal of the Virgin Mary? Remember, this is the goal of the Virgin Mary. To make you into Christ and to make you into her in the easiest way possible. Our Lord said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. He who wishes to save his life must lose it. When you pray this, your will dies. And your will dies a lot. I would rather be watching TV. I'd be rather watching YouTube. I'd be rather listening to podcasts. I'd be rather watching paint dry than praying this most often. But I, Gabriel, who has concupiscence, I need to die inside. I have to. How else can I do God's will unless I deny my will? And how can I deny myself in big things if I cannot deny myself in little things? On top of that, what is another ingredient? What am I killing myself with? Hail Mary, 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 our Father, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. What is Mary's goal again? To make you into her. What did Mary do preeminently besides love God? She pondered things in her heart. What did she ponder the most? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. What did I say the angelic salutation was? It's the most important moment in human history besides obviously the crucifixion and institution of the Eucharist. Why did Mary ponder that the most? Because without God becoming flesh, there can be no crucifixion. Without God becoming flesh, there can be no Eucharist. When she held the baby Jesus in her arms and he's drinking milk from her breast, what is she thinking? God became a man. When she saw the baby Jesus running around, what did she say? God became a man and is running around in my front yard. When she saw Jesus become a young man and she loses him for three days, what is she thinking? God became a man and I've lost him. What did she ponder the most? Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. The moment that all of creation was waiting for, for God to become man. What drives the devil away? Hail Mary, full of grace. What ended his reign? Hail Mary, full of grace. When you are depressed or worldly or have your mind on everything that does not matter and you kill yourself and say, Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. It takes about 50 of them to let it enter the mind. God keeps his promises. God is faithful. I don't care how bad things get. Praying that Hail Mary reminds you that God is alive God is real, God loves you, and it brings to mind the entire mystery of your salvation, and it gives purpose and meaning to your life. And I could go on and on about the power of the Hail Mary. That is the Holy Spirit's favorite moment. The Holy Spirit had been longing from eternity to become one with the Virgin Mary because she's the crown jewel of creation. When you say the Hail Mary, words come into your mind. I said earlier, I, you have to discern God's will for your life. I often don't know what I'm going to say before I pick up the microphone. Talking for s several hours, many different talks on varied topics, my brain is like mush. I can barely remember anything. But when I say, Hail Mary, full of grace, Hail Mary, full of grace, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Holy Spirit starts turning in here and in here. The secret to the church is Jesus. And where did he come from? From Mary, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the engine for success. What else is the rosary? It's meditation on the life of Christ. Thinking about the life of Jesus Christ from beginning to end. We did Lectio Divina and it's very powerful. Lectio Divina is very powerful as you saw. God speaking to your heart. This is Lectio Divina on beads, but in a way that's more powerful, in a way, not necessarily, in a way that's more powerful than just looking at one passage. Because with this, I go from the birth of Jesus, to Jesus' public ministry, to Jesus' passion, to Jesus' resurrection. I am getting an entire image of the life of Christ. There's a very important spiritual principle, and I kind of hinted at it before. When you're in desolation, you think of consolation. You remember this. A grace remembered is a grace renewed. So, for example, if you're in desolation, what do you think? You think of the consolation. Similarly, a grace remembered is a grace renewed. Why 
does the church have a lack of faith in the Eucharist? Because we don't recall the institution of the Eucharist. Why don't we see miracles like at Pentecost? Because we don't renew the memory of Pentecost in our lives. I know people who are Pentecostal, not Catholic. They're outside of the church, yet they meditate upon the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon them at Pentecost on a regular basis, and they work miracles. And we don't. And we have the Eucharist, and we have confession, and we have Mary, and we have the saints, yet we have no miracles. Why? A grace remembered is a grace renewed. When you pray this all day, the mysteries of Christ's life come alive. It's, yeah, it, it is a prayer for children. It seems like that. I learned that when I was a kid. But it also sustains the saints. It also sustains the saints. In here is the power to do anything and everything that God will ask of you. To crush your desolation, to bring consolation, to give you faith when you have none, to give you hope when you have none, to, to cool the burning of temptation in your heart and the despair in your mind that the devil is whispering to you. Our Lady crushes the head of the serpent and her desire is for you to be married. Like this is a very important, uh, this is, I'm, giving, I'm throwing out to you very hard theology. At Fatima, Our Lady told the children, a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, and a ten-year-old, offer sacrifices, pray for sinners. She was calling the children to become like Christ, to become Marian co-redeemers to help redeem souls with the help of the Virgin Mary. And a lot of times people don't like to talk about Our Lady of Fatima because they say, that's a scary one. Talk about another apparition. The Fatima one's a scary one. Why? Because on the third apparition of Fatima to a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, and a 10-year-old, the Virgin Mary opened the ground and took the children to hell. And Jacinta was seven. Sometimes we don't even talk to our seven-year-olds about hell. The Virgin Mary took a seven-year-old to hell. And afterwards, Jacinta could not sleep for three days. And the Virgin Mary told them, you have seen hell where poor sinners go. And they go there because there's nobody to pray and to do penance. Won't you pray the rosary every day and offer sacrifices for the salvation of souls? That sounds at first glance as something scary and negative. But what that really is, it's a message of hope for all of you. For all of you and for me. Why? Because Mary's saying, souls go to hell and you can save them. How? Pray the rosary. The rosary will save them. Why? Because it stinks to do. A part of me has to die. That's a sacrifice. I'm calling down the mercy of God, reminding myself of the power of God. Very, very, very powerful. At Lourdes, the Virgin Mary appeared with a rosary around her arm, just like this. She appeared 18 times to St. Bernadette. Bernadette only had the visions of the Virgin Mary when she began to pray the rosary. It was within the context of the rosary that the Virgin Mary would appear to her and give her messages. A major lesson from that is that when you pray the rosary, Our Lady is present. She's always present. You just don't become aware of it. Mary was present to Bernadette, but Bernadette was only able to sense her, to see her once she began praying. Critically, critically important. Now, Our Lady's a very good mother. Good mothers, yes, they chastise their children, they warn their children, but good mothers also reward their children when they're good. They give their children motivation. So if you look at this picture, beautiful picture, I love this picture because she's holding out her heart and in one hand she has her heart and in the other hand she has a rosary and the scapular. Oh, I love this picture because whenever I'm tempted or I'm angry or I'm whatever, not having my mind in the right place, Mary's saying, give me your heart, Gabriel. And I say, I don't want to. And then she says, pray the rosary. And I say, fine, I'll pray the rosary. Okay, thank goodness, Blessed Mother's here in this holy picture. On the back of this picture, this picture is worth a thousand words, but on the back of it is about a thousand words. I'm just kidding, not a thousand, maybe a couple hundred. And on the back I have written for you 15 promises that the Virgin Mary made to St. Dominic, to Blessed Alan, and of course there's more promises that are associated with it later on. But we're going to go through just a couple of these promises. Very important. Number one, 
Whoever shall faithfully serve me by the recitation of the rosary shall receive signal graces. In your life of discernment, we talked about this earlier, there's going to be moments of consolation and desolation. When you hear the voice of God very clearly, that's consolation. You do those things that you get in consolation. Our Lady is the spouse of the consoler. So when you're in desolation, you pray. God's will in your mind, in your heart, will be made more clear. But this promise is saying, in addition to those consolations, you will receive signs, signals of God's will to help you to do God's will. So let's say, for example, you're discerning where you want to go to college. You're praying and praying and praying, and everybody in your family went to Notre Dame or some crazy school like that, and you kind of feel like God might be calling me to the University of St. Thomas. And you're like, yeah, but UST is local, and I want to go far away, and da, da, da. And then one day you're on a family vacation in, I don't know, the Grand Canyon, and you've been praying the rosary because you got to make this decision. And you go there, and there's a person with a University of St. Thomas hoodie. And then you start talking to them, and then somebody who's not even related to this conversation is like, I have a cousin who goes to the University of St. Thomas. So most people would say, coincidence. But what did we talk about earlier with our angels? There are no coincidences when you're truly trying to figure out God's will. God will confirm. You don't just go based off of, uh, the, I saw three Texas A&M cars in a row. I think I should go there. No, you should be discerning interiorly, getting consolation, and then God will confirm those consolations with signal graces. With signal graces. He is God after all, and he can do that. So Our Lady says, if you're faithful to the rosary, I promise you signal graces. Number two, I promise my special protection and the greatest graces to all of those who shall recite the rosary. Bad things will happen to you. Bad things happen to everybody. But if you have committed to Our Lady by reminding her of these most sacred words, there are no more beautiful words in the entire history of salvation to the Virgin Mary than the Hail Mary. And by giving her these words and being committed to her, she promises to give you special protection. I was just hearing about a wonderful priest who was in a Siberian camp, and it was miserable, but he said, even though I was in a treacherous place, I still felt that God and the Virgin Mary were leading me. And when I look back upon it, I never once got sick, despite being subjected to the worst tortures in the worst environment. And he said, oh, I, was, I had the cross, but I could tell that Our Lady was giving me special favors and protections. My dear friend, Pope John Paul II, I don't know him personally, you have to get this about me. When I feel like I know somebody spiritually, even if they don't know me, I call them my friend. Just in case you're like, man, he's friends with everybody. He knows John Paul, I don't know John Paul II. But my dear friend John Paul II, he's the one who brought us the luminous mysteries. He prayed at least four rosaries a day. In 1981, on May 13th, the anniversary of the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, there was a young girl in St. Peter's Square who had a statue of Our Lady of Fatima. So on the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, statue of Our Lady of Fatima, if you are spiritual, you would notice that's not a coincidence. So he leans over to kiss the statue of Our Lady of Fatima. A few moments later, there's a gunman from this distance right here and shoots him, and he's an excellent marksman. And the bullets that he fires at John Paul II are perfectly aimed and go straight for his vital organs. And yet somehow, inside the body, they miss all of the vital organs. And John Paul II not only is fine, in the grand scheme of things, he has no death anxiety. When you're about to die, you're filled with anxiety, even if you're a pious person, because death is painful and scary. And afterwards, they asked him, Holy Father, why were you so calm? Why were you so peaceful? He says, I knew I was going to live. I have the protection of the Virgin Mary. Although one finger was pulling the trigger, I knew another finger was guiding the bullets. You can be assured, even when the cross comes, Our Lady's going to show her face to you, just like she showed it to Jesus. And the saints say, St. Saint Louis de Montfort will say, every cross you receive is dipped in honey. And because you go from victory to victory, it inspires confidence in you. So normally when something bad happens, you're like, what am I going to do? This is going to ruin everything. But because Mary is constantly helping you, when a bad thing happens, it fills you with confidence. Just little things and big things, Our Lady will dip in honey. And you can be assured if after you've prayed your rosary, 
If something bad happens to you, you can be assured the Virgin Mary will bring something good out of it. Never was it known that anybody who prayed to her was left unaided. Now, the real reason I wanted to give this talk many years ago was for promise number three. Promise number three. Read it very carefully. And I'm going to say things to you that might not make sense to you right now, but I'm saying them to you just in case we never see each other again and I'm not around to tell them to you when you're older. So the Holy Spirit will take care of his guardian angel. Just put this in a special shelf. Give it to them when they need to get it. Promise number three. The rosary shall be a powerful armor against hell. It will destroy vice. This is a promise from the Virgin Mary. What is a vice? A vice is... Not just something you do that is bad, a one-off. A vice is a bad thing that you do that becomes a habit, almost as a second nature, almost like an addiction, almost like you're chained up and you have no freedom, but just enough freedom to be found guilty. It will destroy vice, it will decrease sin, and it will defeat heresy. It will defeat error, theological error, mental error, emotional error. I'm going to start saying things that are not going to make sense real quick. Do not get a boyfriend or a girlfriend until you're done in high school. Do not get a boyfriend or a girlfriend until you are out of high school. Nothing good is going to come of that. High school, especially those students are struggling with severe vices. And you will come to me as a student later, even though you're a bright-eyed student now, you will walk into my program like this. And when I talk about certain vices, all of a sudden you'll put your head down because of your broken heart, because you entrusted your heart to people who are full of vices. No good will come out of having a boyfriend or a girlfriend in high school. Wait till two to three years before you're prepared to be married to discern with whom, with mature people, with the end in mind. The purpose of marriage is to sanctify the spouses and to get the children to heaven. Do not, capital D, do not marry anybody who is not Catholic and practicing Catholic. Why not? What is the purpose of the husband to get the wife to heaven? What is the purpose of the wife to get the husband to heaven? If they are living in mortal sin, they cannot get you to heaven, especially if they are a man living in mortal sin. Men are ultimately responsible for the spirituality of the family. Where the father does not practice the faith, I don't care if your mom is Saint Rita, the odds of the children practicing the faith is 5 to 10%. That means the father, everything hinges upon the grace from the father floating down to the wife and to the children. Where the father practices the faith and is the leader, it doesn't matter if his wife is Jezebel, the children keep the faith 90 to 95% of the time. Because grace flows from the Father. Why do I bring this up to you? Because a lot, it, it, and they have to be Catholic, one, that's very important, but they have to be open to praying the rosary on a regular basis. Why? Decreases sin, destroys vice. I don't care what your problem ever is, whether you're an alcoholic, whether you're a drug addict, whether you're a porn addict, whatever addict you become, Mary promises it will destroy vice and decrease sin. I know that sounds funny, but I get messages from women all the time saying that they got married to somebody who they thought was good. What do I do? I found out my husband was looking at bad pictures. I caught him looking at bad pictures. What do I do? And I say to them, get them to pray the rosary every day with you as a family. Do not let this out of your sight. And I tell her, do this. What happens? I get messages later. It's working. My husband is different now. He fell one more time, but he told me. I, if I, had he not told me, I would have never known. Radical transformation. And then I say, what did you tell him after he told you that he fell into this sin? Because normally it'd be hidden because it's very embarrassing. I, I told him, uh, let me get back to you. I need to pray about this. I said, good move. Now you tell him you want to, him to pray four rosaries. What? I was like, you tell him if he doesn't pray four rosaries, you're kicking him out of the house. What? Are you crazy? Just try it. Trust me. And then they start praying the whole rosary all day. And their father becomes a spiritual ninja, radically transformed, leading the children in prayer, leading the Knights of Columbus, volunteering for this, volunteering for that. Extraordinary, extraordinary. One of my friends, I talked to him about him yesterday. I'm giving you his fake name because I'm recording this. 
We're going to call him Brandon. I told you how he started smoking a lot of marijuana in high school and one of his dear friends who worked at was killed in a car accident shortly after they were both doing drugs and he went to the chapel because he remembered the Holy Spirit put it in his mind what he had to do. Afterwards he came to me and he says, I'm sick of this addiction. My family is in tatters. What do I do? So Brandon, smoking marijuana every day, addicted to bad pictures. His brother, Alex, not his real name, his brother, Alex, addicted not only to marijuana, but using hard drugs on the weekend and having bad relationships with people that he meets on the internet on the weekends. His mother and his father got divorced, and now his mother is living with another man. And his younger sister is now smoking because of the older brother's bad influence and it coming down. And he says, Mr. Gabe, I am an addict. I don't know what to do. And I said, you know what to do. And he said, no, what is it? I was like, tell me, you tell me what you need to do to get out of a spiritual, because it's not just physical. The devil's involved too. What do you need to do? He's like, I need to pray the rosary. And then I said, do you want freedom? And he said, yes, I do. I said, then you need to go all in. And I went like this, put my hand up with a number four. And he said, four? I said, yes, you have to do it. What happened to him? His life radically transformed, radically. His brother, doing all these drugs, came and said, help me. I'm having bad thoughts. I, my brain is a fog with horrible thoughts. And then because of Brandon listening to me, Brandon said to him, you want freedom? Right here. And now Brandon is joining a monastery. He's becoming a monk. And now Alex is becoming a priest. And now his mom is praying four rosaries a day and leaving the man that she was living with that was not her husband. And now the sister is getting clean and praying about what the meaning and purpose of her life is. All because one person brought the Virgin Mary into their house. It only takes one person. It only took one Virgin Mary to bring Jesus Christ into the world. And that can be you. That can be you. Mary will not only help you reform your life. She will not only make you a better disciple, follower of Christ. She will make you into an apostle. She will turn you into a spiritual ninja where you are now snatching souls from hell. Where that becomes you and you're saying, how is this me? I'm not a speaker. I'm not this. I'm not that. You don't have to be. The grace and the charism comes from God himself. There is no problem, I tell you, that cannot be overcome by the praying of the Most Holy Rosary. Now, I've, I said a couple things. Why did I put my hand up like this for this attic with the number four? Because what did I say earlier that St. Dominic heard from the Virgin Mary? She said, preach my Psalter. The Psalter was 150. 150. Meant to be prayed in the morning, meant to be prayed in the afternoon, and meant to be prayed in the evening. If you were to read the little book, The Secret of the Rosary, I have it in my backpack, but on page 12, on page 12, St. Louis de Montfort reemphasizes pray the rosary, all the mysteries every day. And then the next page over, it's to children, to you guys. He says, of course that might be asking too much of some of you, but do at the very least pray five decades of the rosary. This is for children. But what has happened in our culture and in our time, the time where the devil is ramping up his attack major, we're only fighting back with children's prayers. No offense. And so that's why we don't experience these promises that are on the back of these cards. It requires death. But when you die in the morning and you die in the afternoon and you die in the evening, it is Mary who lives in the morning, Mary who lives in the day, Mary who lives in the evening. Now, he said, little children, if you don't pray any rosaries, you barely pray at home at all on your own, do not depend on your family. Because once you remove the family or once you remove the school, then you're going to be like a fish out of water. If you don't pray anything on your own, start with one. Start with one rosary a day if you don't pray anything. If you pray one already as a family, add another on your own. Add another on your own. If you already pray one on your own, Try to get your family to pray as a family. If you already pray one on your own, consider praying three. I always tell people, go for three and allow the Virgin Mary to call you to more. 
when you're ready. It's a lot like lifting weights. If you're not going to go into the gym, put all the weights on both bars, Jimmy, here we go. And then you bend over and you're like, Ugh! and then your pants split because you have never lifted weights before. We don't want that to happen to you, okay? We don't want you to pull the weight bar and you poop on your pants because you've never pulled anything that, that tough with your legs. The same way in the spiritual life. Do something. Do something. I'm going to give you tips on how to pray the rosary. I'm going to give you tips. Tip number one, always carry a rosary with you. Always carry a rosary with you. Oh, you're not going to pray the rosary if you don't. You might one or two times pray on your fingers, but most often you're going to forget that these little fingers are not beads. Always carry a rosary with you. I have one tied around my wrist. I have one in my hand, and I have one somewhere else on my body. What is this guy? I don't know. This is my weapon. I go into battle loaded, trigger ready to fire, no safety on. I can fire one of these bullets off at you at any second. At any time, I'll be like, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou most women, and blessed is for thou Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for sinners now and there, amen. And so, the man in the back corner, I don't pray them that fast. I like to open carry, not only because I'm from Texas and I think it scares the demons. If you would imagine in your own life, if you're at the grocery store, if there was a dude walking around with a pistol, you'd be like, whoo, let's go and get the milk first. <laughs> Crazy man on aisle four. That's what the demon sees right now. He sees a guy not only who's crazy, but will shoot at any minute, ready to fire anytime he thinks that, what, demon over there? Hell, maybe a little one of them. Well, that's not, somebody else, you're scaring me right now with all this language about violence. Grow up. <laughs> Another benefit of open carrying is that I, I remember when something bad happens, I have an option. I, ha I have a way to control the outcome of human events. There might be something bad happening, but I know somebody who can change everything. Her name is Mary, and she listens to me. She's my mother. She cares what happens to me. Very important. Also, it's hard for me to, to go on a phone and spend all day on my phone with these beads because they'll be constantly hitting the screen. So I just carry this with me at all times. We're good. Step number one, carry a rosary with you. Step number two, you need to make a plan. The number one problem for teenagers and why they leave their faith, it's not because they're like, I'm done with Catholicism, slam the door, I'm walking out now. That's not what happens. It's because we've been so emotionalized and the spiritual life is like this, up and down. And so you will pray when it feels good. And that's great. You'll say, hey guys, in the spirit of fervor, the retreats got me high. Let's go on that lake over there and hold hands and do 10 penitential rosaries. And you'd be like, heck yeah. And you, and, and you get a certain high off of that. You're like, yeah, I'm feeling it. Let's get that devil. <laughs> the problem is life ain't high. It's not high. Doing this forces you to mature in your spiritual life really quickly. Because by day two of after the retreat, you're done praying. You're too busy. I got things to do. But if you make it an act of the will, I'm going to pray this every day to keep my mind and my heart on the straight and narrow. This matures you in the spiritual life very quickly. There's a great saying from Bishop Boyle. He says, you will either give up your sins or you will give up this. The Virgin Mary and the devil cannot coexist. The Hail Mary and temptation cannot coexist. My dear friend St. Alphonsus said that the essence of purity is Mary. If you're struggling with purity, he asks you in the confessional, St. Alphonsus, Dr. Moral Theology. He'll say, if you come into my confessional and you're not sure if you sinned or not in this area, the first thing I'm going to ask you, did you call upon Mary? And if you say yes, I'm going to ask you, did you stop calling upon Mary? No, I did not. Then you did not sin. You didn't sin. I'm not sure. Then you didn't sin. You called upon Mary. You didn't stop calling upon Mary. You didn't sin. I can assure it. You fought. You fought. You kept calling on her. You're safe. And he said, and if you did sin because you stopped calling upon her, I can assure you if you called upon her immediately after, you won't be dead for much longer. No child of Mary is ever lost. So you need to make a plan. For me, the first thing I do in the morning is commit Murder. What do you mean murder? You're horrible. Ay, ay, ay. Spiritually speaking, my friends, the first thing I do in the morning is I kill myself spiritually. Why? I roll out of bed. 
I want to check my phone. I want to drink coffee. I want to do everything. I roll on the bed to die. Oh, uh, it's the hardest thing. I roll out of bed and I get on my knees and I'm like, why am I doing this? And all of a sudden, through the desolation comes consolation. And I have a sense of the presence of Mary throughout the day. Pray in the morning. Why? Because if you're going to go on a trip, you want to make sure you have a full tank of gas. Is it okay to pray at night? Sure, but this is the problem. You have to have a plan. If you're saying, I'm going to, and the devil goes at you through the path of least resistance, the devil will whisper to you, remember? He'll say, pray it later, you're busy right now. Yeah, you're right. And then I'll pray before bed. Yeah, pray it before bed. You know, you're really tired. How about you just pray it laying down? Woo! Never was it known that anyone who prayed the rosary laying down did not fall asleep unaided. I don't care if you're an insomniac. You'd be like, Hail Mary, full of grace. <sighs> wow, that's great if you have insomnia and you've already prayed the rosary. But some old ladies will be like, don't worry, my guardian angel prays it. No, my dear, that's your devil speaking telling you that. No guardian angel is praying the rosary on your behalf. I promise. Pray with this laying down if you've already prayed your rosary for the day, if you're doing one or whatever else your goal is. Number three, you need an intention. You need an intention. You're not just praying this just to pray. Our Lady wants you to ask her for stuff. If you've never prayed on your own before, make it a novena. So for nine days, you pray for the same intention. And think about something in your heart that you really want. A circumstance that's really heavy on your heart. Why? So that on day four, when the retreat high is gone, and you're like, man, I'll just pray tomorrow. And you're like, nah, I'm praying for my cousin who's got chemo. I'm going to be really guilty if he dies tomorrow. So you get on your knees and you're like, fine, let's freaking do this. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. So you have to have an intention that's going to keep you doing it so that on the ninth day you make it and now you have the habit of this virtue. Next, do your best. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll be the first person to tell you this. Do your best, comma, but. Do your best, but. Sometimes your best is horrible. That's okay. As long as it's your best. So it's better to do something, this is GK, Ch this is an actual GK Chesterton quote, unlike the quotes I was making earlier. GK Chesterton once said, he probably said it a lot to his wife, if something is worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. You didn't clean the dishes. Hey, if something is worth do doing, it's worth doing poorly. At least I did it. Okay, similarly with Our Lady. On Valentine's Day or on Mother's Day, what do you say to your mom? Happy Mother's Day. Would it have been better had you baked her a cake? It would have been awesome. But at the very least, you said Happy Mother's Day and made her a card, or you bought her a card, or you gave her a card that you found in the drawer from last year. <laughs> If something is worth doing, it's better that you do it poorly than not at all. Of course, do your best. Of course. I'm not saying to be like flippant about it, but the very actions themselves will produce fruit in you. Now, when you get older, this is a, a one more of those older things that I'm going to be putting in your brain and your heart. When it's time to discern if you're called to the sacrament of holy matrimony, who you are going to marry, and you start going on dates and courting and you're talking about your non-negotiables and your deepest held beliefs and all those things, you say to them, are you willing to pray the rosary with me every day? Right up front. If they say to you, no, peace, I'm out. Why? Because that means they don't, they don't want to love you. What is love? Sacrificing of yourself for the sake of the person that you love, sacrificing for their good. If a person, if, the, if you're not special enough to get on your knees and pray 20 minutes, even when they don't want to, then you're not special enough, period. No offense, they're not the one, you're not the problem, they're the problem. And this will ensure virtue in your relationship. Our family is a little church. Imagine if Father David didn't fight for the soul of his parishioners. Imagine if he didn't fight and sacrifice for the sake of his parishioners. It's not easy being a priest. Similarly, if you become a father or if you're a mother and you have children, praying with your family is not going to be easy. It's going to be a fight. But if you don't fight for them, who is? The teens that I have right now, 
that are faithful, that are active. I ask them about their rosary practice, just out, out of curiosity. They all pray the rosary with their family. Pray with your family. Pray with your friends. There's no prayer that goes unaided. Now let's take it back a step. What is the purpose of our life? Union with God. What is the goal of my life? To do God's will. To become a saint. If you forget everything, with this, everything comes. Your reception of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist during Mass, everything you do with this is better. If you're an athlete and you pray the rosary before your game, you will be a better athlete. If you, if you love music and you pray the rosary before your music, you will sing better. And you might say, how could you make such promises? Very simple. I'm not making the promise. Thomas Aquinas makes a promise. Grace perfects nature. When you have grace, it makes the things you are naturally good at better. It supernaturalizes them. That's all I have to say to you. Pray the rosary every day and consider praying it more often than that. There's a great line from the Lord of the Rings about Frodo complaining, I wish I didn't have the ring. I wish this didn't happen to me. Gandalf says something to the effect, so do all people when they're in such times. But it is not up to us about the times. It matters what we do and how we're called to respond. You have the ability to bring Christ into the lives of other people, but it will only happen if you cooperate. Let's conclude in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to reflect upon the mysteries of our faith, to reflect upon all the great gifts that you have given us, to reflect upon the calling that you have on each one of our lives. We entrust our vocations, we entrust your plan for our lives to the immaculate and sorrowful heart of the Virgin Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. This is just one in a six-part retreat that I gave. Also, hit subscribe because we have amazing productions coming up. We have a documentary on St. Therese coming up. We have a documentary on the life of Mother Angelica. Also, I noticed you noticing. I know you noticed me noticing you noticing that I was wearing a sweet hoodie during that little retreat that I gave. Where did I get that hoodie? I don't sell these hoodies, but my assistant, she's got an incredible Etsy store. It's called Mama Mary's Merch. You love that alliteration? Well, you can get a hoodie just like this and many other things there. I will put links in the description below. God bless you, God love you, and we'll see you very soon.